Welcome to the latest episode of Five on the Floor on the Five Reasons Sports Network. Thanks for joining us on your favorite podcast app, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and the Five Reasons YouTube channel. Make sure you hit like, subscribe, and turn the notifications on. Also, check out Off the Floor. It's posted the link right here in the description on YouTube, also on the podcast feeds and at the top of the Five Reasons Twitter feed, $2.99 per month. You can chat all night with other Heat fans. None of the restrictions of Twitter, none of the distractions of Twitter. It's just Heat talk all day long. Also, you get the updates from us, a lot of stuff that we do not put on other platforms. So check it out at Off the Floor. Again, the link is right here in the description. Also, check out Better Edge. Use the code 5RSN. That's the number 5RSN. Get $20 to play. We're going to be running a contest for November. Uh, 10 questions that you can ask related to the NBA. Uh, and You can win merchandise. And again, the contest there. They're all less than 20 bucks, the ones that we run. So we're giving you $20 to play, and you get some free play out of it. Go to betteredge.com. Use the code 5RSN. That's the number 5RSN. And now, today's episode. Down to Biscay. Yay. Uh, five on the floor. Ride for my dogs. Where here's the thing. You can check the score. Hustle hard, couple scars, wearing bubble frogs. Just like Buck to say, you in trouble, y'all. Check the floor plan. Got an all band. Y'all seen the block. Stop the one hand. And Pat we trust. It's power have the guts. We're here to bring the heat. Y'all can hang it up. Welcome to Five on the Floor, a daily insider show on the Miami Heat and the NBA featuring Ethan Skolnick, Greg Sylvander, and Alex Toledo, plus others from the Five Reasons Sports Network. All right, welcome back to Five on the Floor. Here's today's floor plan. I'm Ethan Skolnick. You can follow me at Ethan J. Skolnick on Five Reasons Sports. I got Greg Sylvander. You can follow him at Greg Sylvander. And today we've got Brian Fonseca. He was on the podcast last night as well. You can follow him at Brian Fonseca. And why we're going to talk about where this team is right now through 18 games, 10 and eight, and kind of the feeling that I had as I left the arena last night and why I actually feel better about this team than I have in a while, even though it came off of a loss. But I do want to address one thing at the top because we don't avoid subjects here. And obviously this is the big topic of conversation on Twitter today uh, that Eric Spolstra and his uh, now former wife, uh, have released a statement through the Miami Herald, Sun Sentinel, and other outlets that they are going to be getting divorced. Um, all I'm going to say on this is that uh, this was kind of common knowledge, the situation uh, to some of us in the media and the organization for many, many months. When I've said on the podcast that someone was dealing with a personal situation last season, this is what I was referencing. I obviously didn't feel it was my place to go beyond that at any point. And all I'll say is that everyone should respect their privacy, which no one is actually going to do. Uh, and when I was on social media today, I was seeing a lot of speculation, which is just completely reckless, uh, inappropriate, and off point. And I'm not going to comment on any of it. All I'm going to say is we were aware of the situation. We felt, and I know other media members, and I have respect for them, that they did the same, uh, did not go public with any of this. and. Uh, we wish the best for the family and for the children. And that's all we're going to say about that. Uh, let's get back to basketball here. And let's get back to the feeling coming out of uh, last night. And uh, look, you have a game with no Jimmy. You got no Tyler. You got no Haywood. Those are three starters for this team. You've got a team that's coming in in Milwaukee that was, when it was put together, was kind of portrayed as a juggernaut super team. Although I don't know that the early results have necessarily suggested that that's where they are what they are because they have lost a lot on one end of the floor as they've added to the other end of the floor i liked a few things that i saw from the heat last night one is the overall competition level was really high uh this team is and it's not because the in-season tournament i the heat can talk about how they wanted to go to vegas and all the rest and the extra money but i don't think that's what this is i i just think this is a team that is playing hard okay they've played hard to start the season and we had that question at times during last season. Um, but also the, the thing that, that I like about this group, other than the fact that Bam has taken a leap, and I know you guys focused on that last night, is they just have a lot of interchangeable pieces that you could play with anybody at any stage of the game. And I, I think that my perception of it, and I posted a clip because I got a chance to get into the Bucks locker room afterwards and talk to Dame about Bam. That's posted on the Five Reasons Twitter talked and, and on YouTube. 
talked to Giannis about the Heat. He was very respectful of, about the Heat. I can tell you that. I know people are saying something. There was a comment he made about not having the names or the whatever. I don't think he meant that in a negative way. Um, it's just the way Giannis presents himself and 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 kind of speaks. Uh, I think they came out of that locker room, the Bucks, knowing they'd have a fight on their hands in a playoff series with the Heat. That that was the attitude that that they kind of exuded. I think they have enormous respect for what uh spo does obviously dame does since he wanted to be here um but also i think for the the way that certain guys are starting to fit and so I, i'll go to you first on this greg because you actually posted something in our chat last night not to spill too much uh, not the discord but our our chat on five on the floor saying they need to make a move i actually came out of last night thinking maybe they don't actually so what 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 drove you to text that i guess you weren't supposed to say anything no i'm joking um so it's it, one i'm a fan so i'm reacting to the fourth quarter collapses over and over again i can't get over that y'all like that is something that if they don't clean that up brian said it on the show last night they ain't going nowhere and like that so i am somewhat hyper focused on that issue and how they fix it and I don't know that the way that they fix it is this team evolves to fixing it on their own. Maybe they will. They've done it before. Uh, and I, I understand your sentiment of saying that they're maybe right now when you see how many wings they have, et cetera, that they're not primed for a move because they're pretty deep. But behind Kyle, they're not deep. And if Josh were to go down the the guard room is just totally weird. And so I, I just personally, I can't wait for Tyler hero to get back. I think that that's going to be a big part of this. As I was looking over stats this morning to try to get a handle on the, on the season, their 10th in defensive rating, their 14th in the league in offensive rating. Listen, like that's not bad. I mean, it, like that's where the, we thought they would be actually maybe the defensive a little better, but the offensive, I think we said if they were top 15, that was fine. I, and my homer take was that I put them ninth. And so they're at 14. So that's not that bad. And so anyway, they're getting to the free throw line. They're not turning the ball over. They're causing turnovers. These are all the kind of things that you want to see Miami Heat teams do. I just wonder, one, can they sustain a good level of play? Because they're only two games above 500. So let's not act like they've ran away from any kind of field here. Can they sustain a level of play that keeps them in the mix with the current rotation in the guard room? And just ultimately, can that also lead to playoff success? And, and so I know it's November 29th, but that's the way that we are conditioned to think as heat observers, because this is all about the postseason. All right. Well, a couple of things on the guard room, and then I'll go to Brian here. Um, as you mentioned, we're waiting for Tyler here to come back. And I, I think we're kind of forgetting what he was doing early in the season. I mean, he was basically, I mean, he, he came out of that one game early. Otherwise, uh, his overall averages would look even better. But, I mean, you're talking about a guy who was basically giving you 25, 5, and 5 uh, to start the season. And to pull him from there, and I, I, I'm glad that the narrative is dying, that they don't need him. They do need him. Um, they do need him in part because they don't have a ton of depth in the guard room. They need another ball handler and another creator. Um, and, and I, I look at it and I say, well, okay, now what do you have by the time he's come back? Well, Duncan's more comfortable. You can use them in a bunch of different ways, Josh. And I'll probably do an episode with Alex and Brady on this, but we were watching Josh yesterday and he looks a thousand percent more comfortable than he did two weeks ago. Just on the defensive end, it started to come, but now you can kind of see the vision for where he can help you. The shot looks better, but particularly his ability to get into, uh, the lane, and make that midi, which is something that I didn't feel like he knew where to go to get that early in the season. But now he's starting to figure that out. And the Caleb thing, the last two games have been incredibly promising for him. Um, that's, you know, that, that that that's a huge thing that, that they have his athleticism uh, back in the mix because that's something that they otherwise – Miss and look, my feelings on Kyle are my feelings on Kyle, but the reality is, if you got the Kyle that you got last night, you know, one out of every two games, you take it. Um, Brian, where where do you see? My thing is, I don't see a 
a definite deficiency with this team. Like, I don't see the one thing I'm like, okay, this is going to sink them. I think there are areas that they can get better, need to get better, but I don't, it's not, they're not an awful rebounding team. Defensively, we know they're going to be good. The shooting, I think there's enough, okay, actually, in terms of what they have. And yes, the point guard position is deficient overall, and now you don't have Drew, but you're getting additional ball handler back. So going into last night's game, they were actually fifth in three-point percentage. They were third in free throw percentage. They were third in steals per 100 possessions. And they were second in opponent turnover percentage. So they're forcing a lot of turnovers also. Um, And they've been like just very strong in these areas. And three-point percentage is actually they're still fifth because they went up to 38 now. They were 37.8, not at 38.2 as Greg notes. Um, When going through some of their numbers, and I'm not like, I'm not the hardcore numbers guy. But I do look at numbers. Uh, some of the deficiencies were like they don't block a lot of shots. Again, that's something that they 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 just don't do it. Never. But their defense is built on preventing you from getting to the rim, as opposed to blocking your shot at the rim. That's where Bam comes into play, obviously. Um, and from two, they haven't been great. They were twenty six in the NBA uh, going into last night's game from two point percentage. Um, which tells you that sort of in between game finishing at the rim could be better. That's something that I felt like they could have been a lot better in uh, so far this year. But I think the thing that we need to account for with this team is they are deeper than last year. I think that's confirmed, even though they're on a three game losing streak. Now they have a lot of home games coming up as we outlined Uh, a bunch of them are against teams that they could beat and probably should. (laughs) You know, like Charlotte, Indiana. Indiana is going to be tough to beat twice. But if you're a playoff team, which they should be, you know, and Jimmy Butler's back, you should be able to do it. We'll see what happens with Haywood Highsmith. I think that was a sneaky big loss last night because then, again, Giannis probably wouldn't have hit his over 30 and a half with all them cheap free throws. Um, uh, I was so mad about that. And I just think that they're deeper, but behind Kyle Lowry the Kyle Lowry thing is interesting to me because he's actually he's played better after a slow start but Mm -hmm. can you rely on him the whole season to you know have to do this right like I think he you're gonna need to at least fortify that position whether he's the point guard or not not. not at this minute level Brian I think I think we've we've discussed this like I, I they the Drew Smith thing and I know there there were Heat fans who didn't really understand it and everything else, but you needed somebody, right? Like you needed somebody to get you through a game, a Tuesday night in Detroit that maybe you want to sit Kyle and you think that you can escape that way. They don't have that right now. Um, And Josh is handling off the bench, but I thought it was interesting yesterday. He started Josh. Mm -hmm. We thought he might start Caleb or or Hawkins in Jimmy's spot and then have Josh kind of run the bench as the point guard. He ended up staggering. So there were a lot of different combinations, but they don't have no they look they don't have depth at that position we've discussed that but i I think the overall thing is we talk about their depth and i'm like okay who on last year's team would really be playing significant minutes and who would it be taking away from right gabe would be playing a lot if it was healthy gabe okay he'd be starting starting. he'd probably be starting right kyle would be coming off the bench and i think kyle ultimately would have accepted that because at least gabe had pedigree for doing some of that stuff, right? Not Drew Smith, RJ Hampton do not, okay? Um, Max would have been playing, but then we wouldn't have seen this version of Duncan for extended minutes. Um, and and actually, I think as as well as Max has played in Cleveland, I think we can make the argument that they're Net getting positive. more out of Yeah, it's been a positive, and, and they thought it would be. And then there's the Hawkins thing, which is just like, I mean, you have to play. Have you have to play, play, Ethan. You have to play Hawkins thirty minutes a night. You just have to. You do. There's you, no whether question. whether he starts, whether he comes off the bench, he has to close. He has to be in the closing lineup now. And this is the thing that I'm interested in most when Tyler gets back. Is okay now. How do you just make all that work? Because I feel like your closing lineup has to have the same four dudes all the time: Tyler, Jimmy, Bam, Hawkins, and Duncan is probably the other one. More nights than more nights than he's not, or Haywood well, Highsmith. If you need shooting, I, if you need I, defense, I think a lot of that is going to be offense defense. I one of the things I'm really curious about, and again, this is why I say that I came out of this so encouraged last night. 
is there are so many combinations that I still want to see more of together. And there are a lot of them that are starting to come together. I thought Kyle and Josh looked the best they've looked together last Agreed. night. Agreed. Like, and part of that is, is Josh is just that he's getting more comfortable, but he's learning how to play off the ball with Kyle and Kyle handling a little bit more. Now with Jimmy in there, we know Kyle kind of retreats and goes to the corner and all that. It doesn't look quite the same. Um, we've talked about the Hawkes Duncan combination. I, I, I think the Hawkes Caleb's getting off to a good start. Actually, they're, they're just, they, they have a lot of players who are a little bit different from each other, but again, can switch and guard anyone. And this is why we're going back to what Eric told me before the season with training camp. And I didn't really understand it when he told it to me, he was like, we don't have the duplication we had last year. It's, it's cleaner for me. And I was like, well, well that's weird because they have so many wings. Like you would think yep. there's duplication, but, but every wing is a little different. Josh wants to get to the midi and, and uh, you know, and, and he's going to handle a little bit. He's kind of herky jerky. We know that. Okay. But he's going to defend particularly at the point of attack, right? That's what Josh is going to do. Hawkes is just at this point, And I hate using terms. He's just a baller. I mean, there, it, there's really no characterization for him. Like you, you literally could put him with anybody in any situation and something good is going to happen. Like that's, that's just him. Like he's just, He's just a basketball player. Like someone pretty high up in the heat said that he just said he's a basketball player. Like that is the, that is the highest term of endearment that somebody in scouting can say. He's just, he's just a hooper. A yeah. He's just a hooper. Right. Okay. But, but he's also, he's like a hooper who's like technically sound. Also. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it's it, not hooper. Like I can dribble through my legs and cross you over hooper. And I'm intuitive with that kind of switch movement. Field. It's all about like upstairs what he's doing. Yes, and processing speed. He just makes right. a lot of good decisions. That's really what it is. It's like I, I said it last night. He's like, if you grew up in the 90s or the 2000s, he's the dude that you've seen at the park. And every time you watch him, he's busting people's ass. He's making smart plays. He's not always doing it with scoring because sometimes he does it with passing. He's just and he can do it inside and out. That's the thing. Like the three point shot has been better than I think people expected the defense, which I don't know why people thought uh, the defense was going to be bad. I think they just looked at him and was like, oh, he can't be athletic when it's like he has a very, like very good vertical leap. He was also an all defense player at the Pac-12, a very good conference where he played high level basketball, including a final four as a sophomore. Like he's very accomplished, decorated college career, was a four star recruit. And usually if you're a four-star recruit, you're pretty athletic, especially if you're a wing. And he is somebody who has had that pedigree coming up and was able to become a first-round pick. So, like, I felt like they could plug and play him right away, and I felt like he'd be good right away. I didn't think he'd be this, though, right away. Well, here's the other part of it. Um, he believes he's the best player on the floor when he's out there. It's obvious watching him. It's, all, it's also obvious – with the things that he says, I remember asking him before the season when he thought he'd be ready to play. And he looked at me and he said, right now, I mean, the, the, I, I don't think he's, <laughs> you know, the, he has a certain arrogance to him, but it's a positive arrogance. I'm going to use that word again, that Alex and Brady roll their eyes when I say it, but he's an alpha. He really is like that. Yeah. He, he, he has that thing. Um, like Tyler has, honestly, like Tyler had from the very beginning. And we talk about the combinations. And after the break, I want to get into Bam a little more. But we talk about the combinations that the hero Hawkes thing to me is is going to work, I think. I really do think it's going to work. I don't think they're going to detract from each other. And here's the thing about it. It needs to work because they view future. their future as Bam, Tyler, and Jaime. And Listen. The the great thing about this is they get to start with Jaime from scratch. Like we've talked about like Tyler and Jimmy where sometimes it looks clunky and taking turns, but they're getting Jaime. And here's the other thing about it. Tyler's only one year older than Jaime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Hi Jaime Jaquez on draft night was discussing if people believed in manifestation. That dude is right. on some <laughs> next level stuff. Anyway, let's go to the break. All right. Well, we're going to talk about Bam here in a second, but next level cleaning up after a disaster. Check out Water Cleanup of Florida. Our friends Michael Robert and their team, they also happen to be in the Fantasy Basketball League with Greg and I. We're tearing it down. We're rebuilding. 
they can help you rebuild. If you've got water damage, mold damage, any of that stuff, they also do the preventative work, leak detection, and so much more. Reach out to them at Water Cleanup of Florida, based in Boca Raton, 561-408-7835. Mention five reasons when you do. 561-408-7835. WCUFL.com. If you've got the schmutz, they got the guts. All right, well, we haven't even talked about BAM here. And this is, again, a lot of this is ethereal stuff, right? Like, this is not on the stat sheet. You went into that game last night against Giannis, Dame, the corpse of Chris Middleton, which reappeared at the very end of that game. He can't guard anybody, by the way. They're... They're going to have a serious problem guarding people in the playoffs. I think that's that's the biggest thing. The Heat come out of that knowing they can't guard like they used to. Like you replace Drew with Dame, yes, obviously you add to the offense, and Dame did his thing at the end of the game and all that. And and it was it's crazy because it's clear that Adrian Griffin is sort of just taking the lead from his stars here because he was asked about the last sequence and he said he was going to draw up another play for Dame. And Giannis said, no, let's do it for Chris. And that was the big theme after the game. Okay. So first year head coach, there's going to be some growing pains there too. I thought he made mistakes last night. And honestly, if the officials don't call that BS and then, and then tee up Spo for it, the heat might've actually won that game. Um, they don't, but then they don't defend like they used to. And their defense to me was always the thing that was problematic in the playoffs. But if Brooke has lost a half step and Middleton's lost two steps, that's it's not, and now you don't have Drew. It's not the same thing. But the thing about it was, they went into a game with without Jimmy, without Tyler, without Haywood, and you're like, okay, Bam will be the number one guy tonight. And I don't think we went into prior games where they were missing people and knew that Bam would be aggressive. We thought he might be more aggressive, but it is assumed right now. Like he missed a ton of bunnies last night. Like that could have been a 45 point game for him. He was not perfect, but they drew their energy off of him. And again, at this point it is assumed. And when I talked to Dame about him after the game last night, he said he pulled Bam aside afterwards. It's going to make Heat fans very upset. He pulled Bam aside afterwards and said, man, you got better. And this is someone who is close with Bam. He watches. Has worked out with Bam. I mean, I asked Giannis about working out with Bam, and he denied it immediately. He doesn't like talking about who he works out with. I know they have the same agent. I know they've done some work together, but whatever. Dame doesn't deny it. Dame's like, yes, I'm very close with – I mean, Dame wore Heat colors into the arena last night. But for him to say flat out, Greg, like he's better. Like what we're seeing, they're seeing. Like this is, we don't expect him to have a bad night anymore. Like maybe he'll miss some shots, but he's not going to shrink. And that is a, it's just, there's no way to quantify how big a leap that is for this team. It is. And um, Bam had his second highest usage of the season last night. He was at 33.4. The only game that was higher uh, was 37, and that was that uh, eight-point loss to Boston super early in the year. And uh, he's just, when you look at what he's doing in 42 minutes last night, the way that he's taking responsibility for keeping the team afloat in certain circumstances, that's a different Bam out of bio just from a mentality and like he always does that on defense. He's always the connective tissue to everything good on defense. But now that he's able to be a true hub for them offensively, it changes things because he hasn't always been that he's always had the ability to do it in spurts. Now he's doing it for full games and it is, it's game changing one because it helps this season. And I think as we all were evaluating was this team going to be better? We probably didn't factor in the improvement that Tyler well, that we saw and that Bam is bringing in, obviously, Hawk is, but let's just focus in on Bam. We didn't give enough credit to that. But also, when you look down the line, this dude's not going anywhere. And I think the Heat know that they have a guy that other players, past, present, and future, either want to play like Bam. They remind Bam reminds them of their former selves or they want to play with Bam. So like this is a, a perfect scenario for the Heat and he has 
ascended to a level that even me who screams no ceiling didn't know if he'd get to 23 and 10. I mean, we saw the graphic on the broadcast last night. It's like Shaq, Zoe, and bam, 23 and 10 in heat history. Brian, right now, um, how many teams in the East do you think are definitively better than Miami? Or my, where Miami could get to with this current roster, assuming no big splash trade here. And the Drew Smith thing plays into this too, because now that contract's guaranteed and that's going to further limit them, uh, at least for the time being, in terms of some things that they can do. So wh who's clearly better from what you've seen? I would say Boston. The end? I mean, <laughs> like yeah. Philadelphia's play better, but yep. they need to show me that they can go past the second round of the playoffs. Tell them. Like, it just is what it is. Like, I know that James Harden came and went, but that's not why they lost in the second round. They were doing that before he got there. They did it when Jimmy was there. <laughs> you know, with Ben Simmons and, and Joel Embiid, it's, it's really, can Tyrese Maxey translate to the playoffs consistently, like night in, night out? Because he's had some big playoff games before. Could he do it consistently? Because now they're going to need him to. And how is Joel Embiid going to be in a playoff series? So Philadelphia, I mean, they've been better in the regular season so far. But do you trust them in the playoffs, which is really the question? I'm not sure. Can you definitively say Milwaukee's better? I think Milwaukee, I think Milwaukee is better, but there's a but. And I think that in watching last year's series and watching last night where I saw the same things, the perimeter defense, Kyle Lowry, Kyle Lowry was able to get into the lane relatively easily. Um, so was everybody else. I think if they had Jimmy, obviously, then you could really get a sense of what that can be. But if Jimmy's there for a playoff series and both teams are healthy, I like Miami's chances because Milwaukee can't rise to where they were from a defensive standpoint. While, yes, they can get the offense because that's what Damian Lillard's going to bring. But I'm not sure what Chris Middleton has given you uh, consistently at this point because he's been on a minutes restriction all season and he's playing injured right now and it's going to be playing injured and he can't he can't be a, a thorn in the heat side like he was for the last few years it seems like we'll see when we get to april but i would say that the heat right now are still behind philly behind milwaukee a little bit but I, it doesn't matter in november <laughs> with this organization that doesn't seem to, right? So I, I think they have a, a chance, but I, I still would like to see them do something transactionally, like fortify that the point guard position, uh, you know, get better at the four. Like that, those are it's still the same two spots that we've been talking about for however long at this point, where it's like you're going to need someone beyond Kyle Lowry who can run the team and no, not Josh Richardson, not Tyler Hero, like somebody else. And I do think that, you know, unless Haywood Highsmith is your four, which, okay, it might be Jaime Hawkes, even though I think he's probably closer to a two than a four, which means he's a three. But I think you're going to need to fortify those spots to make me feel good about them having a chance. But Bam's leap, listen, I said it last night, like you saw Shaq was talking about him. Reggie Miller was talking about him. Damian Lillard was saying the same things. I think people came away from that national broadcast watching the game that Bam had and was like, yeah, Bam got better. And oh, by the way, Jimmy Butler was resting an ankle injury and Jimmy's still Jimmy for now. Well, Brady said it when we walked out of the arena last night, when we were talking about Milwaukee, he's like, the Heat didn't have the guy who, who busted their ass with 56. <laughs> mm -hmm. last year. And he did that arena, to Drew Holiday. He did that to Drew Holiday. Not he he's he's gonna do it to the corpse of chris middleton i you know i mean maybe not that but i i I, th I still think he's capable of enough of those moments and I, I think what we've seen is the roster they've constructed now and so much of this is hawk is but uh it's not necessary for him to do that all the time because jaime can do some of those things at this stage and we'll we'll get into caleb and josh Moore on an episode uh on probably the next episode but i i'm really encouraged by what i've seen from caleb the past two games it, it's just so obvious that he the process in terms of him trusting his body again is working and he does give them something different we can talk about Hawkes and josh and all that caleb's athleticism is at a different level than them and and it's just you saw the spin move on the baseline yesterday, the way he's attacking closeouts again. Like 
and ball handling, he bringing the ball he, up like he did that in the Eastern damn conference finals. Yeah. And again, they don't have Tyler hero back yet. So I 10 and eight better record than they had at this stage last season. Not perfect, obviously, but um, I'm with you. I think Boston's the only team that is clearly better right now. I think they're in the Milwaukee uh, Philadelphia class. And I think they're better than Cleveland, uh, New York, Atlanta, and all those other teams of the East. Uh, to me, the goal should be the three seed. And I, I think if they got the three seed, they would be really well positioned. And I think they'd feel just fine about a second round series against Milwaukee if they were the three seed, but a lot of basketball left to be played. Appreciate it. Uh, Brian, Greg, Water Cleanup of Florida, Better Edge. Look for more episodes coming forward. Make sure that you subscribe so you get every episode. We're starting to put more on the feed, including uh, the show that Brian hosts, which is uh, Floor's Yours, which goes weekly. And what, what day are you going this week? You're going tonight, right? Tonight at 9 p.m. Wednesday. So if you if you hear this on Thursday, it is up on YouTube, and uh, it will be on the 5 on the Floor feed. And also check out Floor Crew, which is hosted by Jonathan Ramlikan and the rest of our crew. So uh, trying to give you some more voices here on the podcast and YouTube feeds. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you for listening to The Five on the Floor on the Five Reason Sports Network. After all, someone needs to listen to my dad. <laughs>